Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. By my count, we're on episode 808. And as you can see, I'm back in Libertyville, Illinois. If you're watching the video in the studio uh, on the heels of a, of a long GA season, I'm sure there are other GAs going on somewhere, somehow, but I got back from the OPC GA and the PCA GA, the latter of which was in Memphis, Tennessee, and I'm delighted to be back uh, for an episode of Christ the Center. Welcoming to the program, I believe for the first time, at least on this program, we certainly talked a lot, and and our, our listeners would certainly know you, but we have Jonathan Master, president of Greenville Theological Presbyterian Seminary in Greenville, South Carolina. Welcome back to the program, or to the program, Jonathan. It's good to see you. Camden, it's great to be here. The only thing that's missing is the last time we were together, I think we were eating ribs in yeah. Memphis. And so you can't this beat is, that. This, this is not that, but it's a close second. At least we get to talk. Yeah, this isn't Presbycast, so we try not to eat while we're while we're recording. <laughs> and uh, some people, ha- I'm one of them, but some people have that thing where you hear someone chewing on a microphone and it just flips a switch. You like you can't handle it. Like I'm one of those people. I'm usually not uptight about that kind of stuff. But that for, triggers. There's you. some trade. <laughs> it's, it's triggering. <laughs> That's the right. It's more that this is a major aggression, not a micro macro aggression oh. in my. <laughs> In my book, but it's one of those things. Yes, uh, I'll let you maybe report, but uh, we got plenty of time to interact at PCA General Assembly uh, at Charlie Virgo's rendezvous, which was an event uh, held by more in the PCA. It's a wonderful organization. We spoke with Brad Isbell about that a couple weeks ago, and uh, also just our typical conference interactions as well as our Reform Forum booth wasn't too far around the corner from. The Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary living room, which is the the mobile living room. It's a it's a highlight of the of the GA season to it's be able awesome. to see you uh, right around the corner. Yeah, no, we were we were really pleased. Lots of people stopped by the booth. Lots of people stopped by your booth. I know as well, and uh, it's just a great opportunity to rub shoulders with folks that we see occasionally, but some some that we only see once a year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're very thankful for all that you do. Thankful for our mutual friend and your colleague, Pat Daly. Many people will know him as well. Now he's vice president of Greenville, doing some excellent work. And uh, I joke about the living room because he, he, I was chatting with him about how all this works. You know, he's a, he's a conference guy, did that for, for many, many years at Banner of Truth. And, uh, you know, was figuring out how much it would cost at one of these previous events to rent furniture and realized he could outfit his office for very affordably for less than the rent of one and uh, that you have some willing workers or at least workers that you can instruct <laughs> to take the, fir- to the, take the furniture there. to these events. And it all works exactly. out. Exactly, <laughs> It all works out. So the only downside of it is this morning I walked into Pat's office and, and there was nothing. no furniture in it <laughs> because it hadn't gotten put back yet from the from the assembly but other than that other than the occasional in between day where we have no place to sit in his office it works really well and it's and it's fun at the at the events because it really does draw people we get a chance to sit down and talk with them at length and Mm -hmm. um and 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 relax with each other oh it's great it's it's high class uh i mean it's it's a wonderful presentation you get a one of the booths up toward the front and uh, at the previous several events, I mean, last year at, at uh, PCAGA, and then I believe we ran into each other at, um, or I ran into the GPTS at uh, Ligonier, spent time with the guys there. Uh, it's good. It's wonderful. And you're able to have lots of conversations with people in a venue where, you know, a lot of these people might not know about Greenville or, or not necessarily going to make the trip yet. But uh, by having this space and the the time to be able to sit down and talk with people. It's, it's wildly beneficial. These conferences are very, very useful for that. It's very good. Tell me about, uh, I, I was a beneficiary of the OPC GA, uh, breakfast. Uh, Pat gave a wonderful presentation about the goings on at Greenville. I get down to the conference every March and love it. I absolutely love it. I was telling you guys, uh, and I mean it, that if all we did was the men's fellowship the one evening, I would still take the flight, get the hotel and the car to do that. But having that plus a week of of presentations and conversation, it's a no-brainer for me just to mark that on my calendar. But um, there's some really exciting things going on at the seminary. I'd, I'd love to give you the opportunity to share with our listeners about uh, the library expansion and some other things that you have going on because people, I think, would be excited and encouraged to hear it. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Mm-hmm. Uh 
It is an exciting time at the seminary. You mentioned the spring conference. That's always a highlight of the year for us. And we're already looking forward to next year's spring conference. This year, we packed it out and sold out but before the early bird uh, time frame was up. So yeah. uh, we're, we're excited about that for next year. And, and this, this next year's spring conference is on global missions in the mm. reformed world. So uh, should be, should provoke a lot of good discussion and we're already, we're already looking forward to it and, and asking the Lord to bless it. In terms of the seminary more generally, we just had Greg Beal in for a yeah. summer seminar and that was uh, an it was really a smashing success. It was great. Greg and I have known each other for a long time, so it was fun to reconnect with him, but also it was just good for our our students and other others in the area to hear from him. Uh, this summer is always a little bit of a uh, a downtime. They're, the students are more or less gone, but um, but we're busy because, like you said, we are we're making plans if the Lord provides the funds and, and we'll have to see whether he, mm-hmm. he does or not. But if the Lord provides the funds next summer, we hope to be under construction downstairs, renovating our library and really our whole downstairs entryway space as well. We're kind of, we're talking to people right now about that. We'll probably do some launch type events um, in the next few months, mm. but um, that takes some time. You know, we're, we're, it also looks as if, I mean, it, we won't know until August, but it looks as if we may have our largest incoming class of in-person MDiv students. Oh, and that's, and that's really what we do. You know this, Camden, but mm-hmm. maybe the listeners don't. We we really focus on training pastors. We're, mm-hmm. we're training ministers for the gospel uh, work in churches. And so what that means is we're, we're pretty focused. There's a lot of things we say no to, a lot of things we don't do, a lot of degrees that we don't offer because we want to do this one thing right. that the Lord and and the church has called us to do very well. Um, we've welcomed, you mentioned some staff hires lately, mm-hmm. Pat among them, uh, but also Bill Van Duduard, uh, who's serving, at, doing an excellent job finishing up his first year as academic dean and professor of church history, and perhaps some other um, additions like that on the horizon. So Ooh. the Lord has been extremely kind to us. We're very grateful. Oh, praise God. Thanks for that update. People can find out everything they'd like to know, uh, gpts.edu. I do encourage people to take a look at that conference, and uh, we'll certainly be there next year. Uh, The library expansion is extremely exciting, and uh, not just expanding the library, but reconfiguring the main floor a little bit to allow for um, greater flow, uh, uh, students being able to study on site more frequently and having more space and good uh, times for conversations uh, in the library, et cetera. So there's a lot of good things that are going on, and I encourage people did, to take a look. And, did you get to see yeah. the plans, Cam? I did. Did, did, did I they did. open up the laptop for you? Uh, we had, wow, this is high-tech stuff. So at the OPC. Oh, you were at the OPC <laughs> one, and they did the whole presentation. We had a projector. I mean, this is this wow. is like really, as you know, as a former OP guy, like this is this is next level. <laughs> <laughs> did did uh, did the denomination have to rent that, bring it in? I don't know. Uh, that was at the it was at uh, the breakfast. So this wasn't in the assembly. We 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 have right, a projector right, right. at the assembly, but that's only used for basically displaying memes and uh, our vote <laughs> our vote tallies. So we have no cameras, no nothing, none of that like you guys do at the PCAGA, um, which is probably a good thing because I I see enough of these funny memes coming out of screen captures from the PCA General Assembly. A live stream. I can only imagine what the OPC <laughs> memes might look like. It's different, but I did get to see the plans uh, seriously, and you have wonderful facilities. Uh, it's 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 wonderful. I was commenting on this to you, perhaps, and to some other people as well. It's one of the strengths of the GPTS layout. The building uh, affords for the opportunity for lots of interaction between students and professors throughout the week. And Mid America has a similar layout. We don't have two stories, mm-hmm. but. Those are the strengths, uh, even of the architecture, that students and professors, faculty, staff, they they spend a lot of time interacting with one another. It's not as if you only see your professor during a course, you know, during the one hour uh, or two hours a week that you might might see them, and then they go home or go to their office, which is in a completely different building. It's all right there, which is good. And then the 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 upgrades and the expansion and the reconfiguration i think are only going to make that better it it's it's great i think you guys got to figure it figured out i'm looking forward to seeing it when it's finished 
Well, thanks. I mean, it's really one of the things that we we emphasize with our professors that we're here not just to teach and right. and then get out of the classroom and do our writing or whatever. Um, we really are here to have a kind of pastoral ministry to our students. We're not mm-hmm. we're not the local church, obviously, but but right. at the same time, pa- students are with us in the hallways, like you said. We're having coffee with them, and that's part of the architectural setup. But then, in addition to that. You know, students in our homes all the time yeah, and yeah. and a lot of interaction. So you got to do that. Everyone's a churchman. Everyone's involved in their local churches and the students yes. are very much plugged in there. And that, that this is what it's about with spiritual formation. I mean, it's the Holy Spirit that works in the hearts of students and professors and staff alike. But, uh, you know, certainly a culture of an institution can drive that one way or the other or <laughs> make it better, yeah. make it worse. And so it's yeah. it's nice to see... Uh, the culture there. I notice that among Greenville students too, when you talk to them, uh, they are academically interested. They are talking theology. They are talking church history. There's no doubt about it. But one of the driving uh, things they talk about most frequently is involvement in the church and what's going on mm-hmm. in church courts, which is encouraging to me. See, I'd, if, if I'm only going to hear one type of conversation in a seminary, I'd much rather it be what's going on at General Assembly versus what was the latest article in Jets or something. <laughs> Right. Something. Right. But I'm, right. I'm all for academics. I don't think anyone can fault me or, or Reform Forum for, uh, you know, minimizing the academic side of things. But you get my drift. Uh, oh, I do. <laughs> and, you know, Samuel Miller, second professor at Princeton Seminary and, and kind of a hero of mine, I quote from him all the time. He said something like this. The true genius of the mm-hmm. Reform Seminary is to bring those two things together, mm-hmm. the development of personal piety and then also this rigorous academic training. It's not academic for ac- academic sake but right. it is rigorous academic training and then and then also personal piety and concern for the church amen amen partly that i guess uh, it's a good segue to bring us into um the book today as we're going to be talking about a book jonathan's written titled reform theology which is in the theology matters series which is edited by jason hillopolis uh really excited to to speak about this uh, but i guess i should also mention the theology on the go podcast too because you do uh, a short conversation on a on a deep and eternal truth uh, the most recent episode i believe is on Isaac Watts, if I'm not mistaken. So there, you got some I think that's right. some uh, piety and practical theology connected with history in in various ways. So we see that as a theme in in many of the things that you're working on. But uh, check that out for those who uh, know our our good old time friend James Dolzell. He's a co host on that program as well. I'll have a link to the episode or to the podcast in the episode description for those who'd like to check it out after the fact. But um, Turning our attention to this book, Reformed Theology, Jonathan, I wonder if you might tell us a bit about this series, how you were introduced to it and ultimately invited to, to write this really wonderful book. Well, it's a delight to, to explain it. It was um, a remarkable series of providences. I, I was, uh, can't remember who, who reached out to whom first, but mm. I was in touch with the uh, some of the folks at PNR who were asking me about book ideas. And I, and yeah. I shared with them essentially the idea behind this book. Mm. I did not know that this series was being, was in the works at the time. That's great. Um, and so I explained to them the, 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 the audience and the aim and the size and the general, some general topics I had in mind. And they said, you know, you really ought to talk to Jason Holopoulos mm-hmm. because we're working with him on this, multiple book series called blessings of the faith and um and and this might actually be a a great fit into that series mm-hmm. and so jason and i talked and it immediately it immediately became clear that we had virtually the same vision for how this would play out and for what these books would explore so so then he asked me uh to to write the volume on reformed theology and so that's kind of how it came about i had it i had it in my mind and but then it, it was also it fit perfectly with what he had already planned and I, i'm so grateful to be a part of the series because what he has planned goes well beyond what i would have ever thought of in terms of uh the various topics that he wants to cover and and the scope of of really the whole series no, that's wonderful. Yes, uh, the series is Blessings of the Faith. If I misspoke a moment ago, but uh, we'll certainly have all the press information there as well to link. So thanks for that um, 
that remark. I was excited to see this book. I think there's a lot of, uh, there are many use cases for this for me. One, I enjoyed reading through it myself, but also this is a kind of book where I can share this with people. I think this would be a, an excellent book where we might even be able to have stacks of it at church to hand to various people that are coming to a Reformed church for the first time or don't understand all of um, what goes along with being Reformed. Uh, that's that's somewhat of a flexible word, uh, you know, and I have my thoughts. Of, everyone has their own thoughts about, about it and whether it should be capitalized or not and in what context. But I'd love to ask you and hear your thoughts about this with respect to this specific book. What what? How do you use that word and define it for you with regard to this book? What does it mean to be reformed? So I would say, first of all, that that was the most difficult question to answer, but it was also one of the reasons I wanted to write the book. Yeah. So there were really, if, if there are two aims in this book, one is to say, um, what do we mean when we say reform theology or what what is it generally meant uh what is generally meant by the term and then and then also why is this a biblical concept and a blessing i mean the blessings mm-hmm. of the faith theme which was again uh jason's um idea as far as i know is 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 just a great one because what we want to do is we want to take these concepts these doctrines and show uh, how how they apply and and why they're good things so, but the definition question was was tricky because, as you know, um, there are a lot of different people out there who have some pretty strong ideas oh, yeah. of what it means to be reformed. Is this person reformed? Is this church reformed? That's a question that right. gets asked a lot, and it gets asked not just in an academic level and argued over at an academic level, but it gets asked at a at, at a at a much more on the ground level because because you hear it used all the time in our churches. Mm-hmm. Uh, you'll have people come up. To, to you, and I'm sure many of our listeners have had this experience. When did you become reformed? Or <laughs> how did you become reformed? That's or, my next question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, right. But but the thing is, it I think for a lot of people, there are there's co- confusion or or right. just there are assumptions behind that. So definition was key. I knew it had to be tackled right away. And in some sense, that was the most difficult thing to nail down. Sure. And I'm sure my definition isn't gonna isn't going to make everybody happy. But I zeroed in on three things. And they may seem disconnected, but but there's a logic to them. The first is I did focus on the solas of the Reformation. Now, I know those, those came later. They weren't always articulated in the way they are, but the solas of the Reformation and the implications of those things, mm-hmm. the, 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 the scriptures alone, uh, Christ alone, faith alone, grace alone, um, to the glory of God alone. Th- these were These are... I think effective ways of describing the key issues in the Reformation. Yeah. Now, again, they weren't articulated that way at that time, but they are effective uh, shorthand ways of describing what was at stake in the Protestant Reformation, what continues to be at stake. So, absolutely, the the solos and their implications is one. The second thing that I keyed in on, and, and this is where it becomes more controversial, although although even the first point is a little controversial is a, a, an emphasis on covenant theology. Mm. Uh, I, I think rightly understood. If you look at the mainstream of reform theology, it is, it, it is shaped by a biblical theology that is covenantal. Um, and then thirdly, um, this is more of a, a modern way of defining it, but I think it, it's important because it connects us to a historical stream that it is that I, I, I say that, Reform theology is also defined by or kind of fenced in by a historic creed and, or confession mm-hmm. from the Reformed tradition. So that was a way of tying it explicitly back into a historical stream. Now, again, there are other ways to do it. There are uh, ways that historians define reform theology, and I actually talk about that a little bit at the beginning. Yeah just by way of introduction. And and the I think the most popular way that people define Reformed theology today, and they say, I'm Reformed, or mm-hmm. are you Reformed? What they mean is something like, are you a Calvinist? Right, exactly. Uh, and that that obviously is a, is an important feature of Reformed theology, our, our understanding of the sovereignty of God in election and in salvation. But I think both of us would agree that that doesn't capture the full-orbed uh, nature right. of of the reformed faith. So, 
How, how about you, Kim? Then you, yeah. you you have a podcast with reform in it. That was I a know. big risk on your part, and so yeah. Uh, and I've uh, I've grown in. What did in I get wrong? You didn't get anything wrong. I, I agree with you, but a little autobiography. So I grew up in the mainline PCUSA. The individual church where I grew up was rather conservative, all things considered. Has since now joined with the EPC. So. Uh, when I was growing up, the pastor is a five-point Calvinist. They held to the inerrancy of scripture, all these sorts of things. And there are a lot of rural churches like that, that kind of basically, they're, they're functionally not Presbyterian at all, because they're basically just saying, as long as the denomination or the Presbytery doesn't make us be liberal, we'll just do our own thing. And we'll withhold our money from them, and we won't give the denominational askings. Not my preferred plan of of uh, ecclesiastical life okay but anyway when i went to college i was kind of figuring things out eventually uh, through campus crusade for christ and friends that i came about uh meeting uh, ended up visiting lots of different churches and uh, through that experience the lord eventually led me to what might be called a reformed baptist church but small r not not a 1689 church but a basically a Calvinistic Baptist church with a lot of influence from the Master Seminary and John MacArthur. So he's a great example. People will love MacArthur. They'll say they're Reformed. But over time, I started to learn and grow that I did not um, agree with you know the interpretation of the Old Testament in a lot of regards. I had enormous and immense respect uh, for the expository preaching and of that church as well as uh, Pastor MacArthur. Um, I'm still indebted and in any way one of us can be indebted to one another, uh, but in, in, as a matter of speaking, indebted to um, his, his expository preaching for teaching me what you know a sermon at its core ought to be, you know, an exposition of the text and preaching the gospel from the text. But I came to realize that this didn't fit with my instincts. And so even though I grew up in a mainline church, I still was more accustomed to, even though I wasn't maybe self-conscious of it, I was still more accustomed to a covenantal reading of scripture. And as I started to read and study myself, I realized, no, this is what the Bible's teaching. And that, long story short, I ended up becoming more and more confessional. I stumbled into some more reform resources from professors at Westminster Theological Seminary, etc., and came to realize that I indeed, you know, subscribe to the Westminster standards. So I, so I went through that long path to find out what I believed, you know, was now I'm not reformed with a small R, but confessionally reformed, and came right. to believe that this is this is a better definition of this. This is how we ought to ought to use this word. Until about seven eight years ago, I started to get more involved with the work down at Mid America Reformed Seminary. So I came all this way to find out I was truly reformed or reformed. You know, the capital R only to find out I'm not reformed. I'm a Presbyterian <laughs> because other yes. people use the word yes. to refer to the continental tradition. So that's the right. one knock on our organizational title, Reformed Forum, and I'm trying to fix this. But um, we do want to involve the wider breadth of our NAPARC and ICRC brothers who subscribe to the three forms of unity, for example. So it depends on the circle. So Jonathan, you can't make it everyone does. happy all the time. Even if no, you're confessional, you, you still, some people might say, well, you're not reformed, you're Presbyterian. You're, you're absolutely right. And, <laughs> and a lot of those voices were in my head as I was writing this. You know, I'm trying to make it as, as simple as possible and yet genuinely uh, include whatever needs to be included and uh and all those voices were in my head so you're right i knew i knew it wouldn't satisfy everyone um and i tried to even in my lead up to the explanation make a nod to why it might not satisfy everyone uh you know there's this way of looking at it there's that way of looking at it that that uh, ha has sure. have some legitimacy to it and ultimately i'm also not really too concerned with being the guy who polices who's reformed no, and no, who's no, no. not. That's not the purpose I mean, of the book. No, no, it's not. It's it's really not. It's to it was to give a kind of shorthand set of, you know, if, if maybe sort of tent pegs you can grab onto that um that will will help you understand in a mainstream way yeah. what what we're aiming at. Tell me a bit about your story. What led you to uh eventually become, you know, an OPC, a PCA minister? And yeah. uh, president of a seminary that is, you know, extremely uh, convicted and uh, yeah. and, and uh, certainly following after and seeking to teach uh, the Westminster standards in particular. Well, that's a 
I, I don't have it. I don't have the elevator pitched down as well as you do, Camden. I, I, I get the feeling you've told that story before and you did it well and succinctly. So I probably won't. I'll probably meander around a little hey, bit. But we got the time. Um, the the if I if I can try to encapsulate it, I would say this. Um, my father was raised in a mainline Presbyterian home. In fact, um, his grandfather was a minister and was actually mm-hmm. involved. Um, at the time, Machen left the denomination. There's a whole story there we could go down, but that's for another episode. Um, so so in any case, my my father was raised in in the among all these people that we read about um, in in mid 20th century mainline Presbyterianism and. By his own account, he he never re- remembers even really hearing the gospel. So mm. it's it's a sad it's a sad account. But um, he ran into someone who ended up uh, inviting him to church, and uh, this is this is when he's an adult, but in his in his late twenties, and um, and uh, it, it's a Bible church, a small little Bible church that he never would have found otherwise, and uh, and he hears the gospel, and he begins yeah. reading his Bible, and the Lord opens his eyes and, and saves him gloriously. Um, so from that point forward, my dad, and then, and then he, he met my mom not too long after that. My dad and mom were, were really engaged in Bible churches, independent Baptist churches, that kind of thing. And, uh, and that was, so that's, that's the environment in which I was brought up, which I'm so grateful for, because generally speaking, these were places that were interested in, studying the scriptures and clear on the gospel, um, clear on uh, a- emphasizing the need to be personally uh, born again. Um, so lots of good, raised by very godly parents. And in fact, I dedicate the book to them. Yeah. Um, but along the way, uh, along the way, I had some some different influence as well. Uh, 10th Presbyterian Church was the church that I uh, attended while I was in college and Dr. Boyce was minister then. And, and that had an immense, I mean, I, I'm still, I, I feel like I'm still unpacking the, the effect that had on my life in, yeah. in good ways and just sort of seeing different things. Oh, where did I pick that up uh, through 10th? And, and that's part of the reason why I, I've remained as connected as I have with the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals because mm-hmm. Dr. Boyce was, that was a big part of his work. Oh yeah. Um, also, Banner of Truth um, folks, I got involved in the Banner of Truth Ministers Conference fairly early on in my own ministry, and uh, and that had a huge influence on me as well. So, so there was no um, uh, road to Damascus experience for me, but gradually, and I think you described it this way too, gradually I began to see that some of the things, I don't think the most important things, but some of the things that I had um that I had been exposed to early on in my church context were things that I, I no longer was compatible with in terms of my understanding of the uh, biblical theology, my understanding of the scriptures, the sacraments um, and, and ecclesiology more generally. So that Mm -hmm. led me um, ultimately to first to an independent reformed church, then to to the OPC and, and, uh, and very, very happily settled as someone who, I'm just I'm just delighted to subscribe to the Westminster standards. They got it. represent my own convictions really thoroughly and and well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. I appreciate that. We're sorry to see you go out of the OPC, but we're <laughs> very happy uh, that we have ecumenical ties and that you're serving well in the PCA. So uh, that's we're thankful for that. Um, why don't you tell tell me about uh, tell all of us a little bit about the target audience for this book, not necessarily in a business sense, but but in terms of what are your hopes uh, and intentions for this book? How do you hope it would be used? And uh, that might give us a better sense of uh, how readers like me and everyone else listening might be able to use it in their own lives and also share it with others. Well, the book's only been out since late April, but one of the things that I've been struck by and grateful for is the the wide variety of feedback I've received from mm. different types of people. I, in my mind, I wrote it for someone who ha- I, I was not assuming any background with theological um, terms. So I, while I, I didn't, I didn't 
dumb it down or anything right. like that. But but I I didn't assume any technical expertise. I didn't assume that some the reader necessarily had read uh, a bunch of systematic theology in the past or anything like that. I, I obviously someone who's going to pick it up has to have some interest in what reformed theology is. But but I didn't want to assume any of those things. So in that sense, I I tried to aim it at someone who might come to your church for the first time and ask, what is it that you believe or what, what, what do people mean when they say reformed? And you could put this book in their hands. Mm -hmm. What's been, what's been very uh, eye opening and gratifying for me. Cause I hoped this would happen, but I didn't know if it would happen is the number of pastors who have written to me and others who, who, who clearly have a tremendous amount of theolo rich theological exposure in their past, but who found it, uh, a clear and concise statement of uh, uh, of the conclusions that they've reached in more settled and deep mm -hmm. ways, and so I, I like I'd like to think that that it's something that a lot of people would be interested in, even if they already are convinced of Reformed theology and maybe pretty pretty have a pretty good amount of depth in it that this right. would crystallize and clarify. Because I, I I don't know how it is for you, but I I love reading those kinds of books. I I, I I don't want just a steady diet of books that are uh, stretching me in 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 great um in great ways that I've never been exposed to in the past. I also want books that crystallize yeah. and clarify and help reinforce. sharpen for yeah. me. Yeah, reinforce yeah. um what I've already been convinced of it. And I, I find sometimes those kind of smaller, shorter, simpler books tend to really help. Uh, me zero in on my own conviction. So yeah. wh who did I have in mind? I had in mind someone who didn't necessarily have a lot of background information, but in, in, in God's providence, I think it's gotten into the hands of a lot of people who do have that background and it's been encouraging that they've ha how to see how they've responded. No, oh, that's great. I, I echo that thought. I mean, that's how it hit me. Uh, my first thought was, Oh, I could share this. I thought of a dozen people I could share this with right away. Right. But also benefiting. I, I, you know, I might have learned a, a few things or applications, but it's not like it's necessarily new information for me. But that it's not intended to be that for for people. But I benefited greatly from it. So anyway, you hit the mark with me, and it's a good reminder. We got to mix some of these things in, you know. So I'm not just reading some crazy polemical theology or post Vatican II Catholics and stuff like that. Like. Yeah, take a break, man. Like you gotta, you gotta read some, <laughs> some things that are like encouraging. <laughs> that, right. <laughs> you know, they'll build up your faith. You know, so yeah, that's that's important, and it, it's good to shift gears uh, also when you're reading, uh, not just genre wise, but even even uh, subject matter, I suppose. You know, you mentioned the five solas. Uh, I would I would imagine that most people that are Calvinistic already, so they're if they consider themselves reformed. Uh, however, we right. want to qualify that. Most people are going to be all for uh, the five solas. I suspect I'd be hard pressed to imagine a case in which they weren't. But the covenant theology one, I agree entirely. I think we got to include that. That's why in the past I've I've over time shifted away from calling. Uh, you know, MacArthur types, Reformed Baptists, and I reserve that for my 1689 brothers. But even there, I might have a little quibble with them on uh, in, in, in friendship. But um, the covenantal aspect truly is, I, I believe, essential and important. And I'm wondering if you might unpack that a bit and how the idea, the notion of the covenant, uh, not just as a theological construct, but really as a hermeneutic, when we start talking about the organic unity of the scriptures and et cetera, you know, et cetera. Why is that and how is that core uh, here to the Reformed and confessional cause? Well, I agree with you that it is it is at the at the core. You know, it's hard to read. So just to make a historical point, it's hard to read uh, historically Reformed sources mm -hmm. and not see them pretty quickly taking a deep dive into the covenantal implications of a particular passage of scripture. So, right. so in other words, just from a historical descriptive perspective, if I'm just trying to describe what reformed theologians believe, um, they, they think covenantally. Yeah. And, and that comes out in all kinds of ways as they do their dogmatic work, but, but also, especially as they do their exegetic work. 
Why is it important? Well, fundamentally, to be a, a Reformed Christian is to be a whole Bible Christian, yeah. to understand the continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that continuity is largely expressed through the centrality of the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is shown to us through a succession of covenants and through an overarching covenantal structure. So what 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 you see is that it it brings together it brings the Bible together. It brings Old and New Testament together. It shows the unity of the scripture. It shows the centrality of Jesus Christ. And it shows how it is in redemptive history that God has successfully worked out his redemption in the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's that's wonderful. Important. And I never understood, you know, the this idea that God for the, it seems incongruous to me. And I don't mean to be combative or not with you, but with the people listening <laughs> or uh po overly polemical, but it seems so odd to me if somebody would argue that God is all sovereign, that he works out his plan of redemption, that, you know, for someone to be a five-point Calvinist, but then to right. be a more of a, more toward a classic dispensational view to say that, you know, God has to go with his plan B. Now, I know that's, I'm being overly simplistic, but the, the organic unity of the scriptures and the unfolding plan of redemption from beginning to end, uh, which centers on the, the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, to me is just so essential. And then when you start bringing in more non-reformed ideas of, you know, reinstitution of sacrifices and a rebuilt temple and all this kind of stuff, which tends to go along with uh, more dispensational premillennial eschatology. It's just, it's it, it conflicts. It conflicts with the soteriology. And so, you know, we also don't want to be rationalists and uh, not that we're irrational, but we're not rationalists in the sense of like trying to figure everything out, kind of like um, Gordon Clark in his book, uh, The Problem of Evil Solved. You know, <laughs> right. it doesn't work right. like that either. Right. But, it, um, you know, we should expect that there should be a harmony from beginning to end. And we see that in the scriptures and it's encapsulated in, in the doctrine of the covenant that God has been working. We have two public figures, Adam and the second and last Adam, Jesus Christ. And... Um, once you know that really unlocked things for me. Once once that was, you know, expounded to me in in basic books like like Clowney's, uh, the unfolding Min mystery, and then eventually moving up to Will Palmer Robertson's Christ mm -hmm. of the Covenants, books like that. It's, it's like it's like I had a whole new Bible. You know, <laughs> it's like yeah. oh, it's like where, where's this been? This is amazing. It, it, it's wonderful to see how the Lord's working. I don't know. Do well, you have a similar you know, experience coming? Well, yeah, to those I have. Convictions? I have for sure. And and it gets to the subtitle. This the the fact that this is part of a series called Blessings of the yeah. Faith. I, I talk about this a little bit in the book. That it does provide an interpretive key that unlocks your Bible and and shows you the and, and what you see when when your Bible is unlocked is that it centers on Jesus. Yeah. And so there's tremendous blessing there. And then of course it also. And this gets into areas where there is some disagreement, and you talked about Reformed Baptists and others. Um, it also then provides an interpretive key for understanding how we should see ourselves, our yeah. families, our churches in, in through a covenantal lens, sure. if you will. So it, the, the, the first thing I think people find when they begin to understand covenant theology is they find what you just described really well, which is your Bible's opened up to you. <laughs> but then the next thing that you have to reckon with, and, and these implications could take a while to tease out in individuals' lives, is, okay, now what is what is the fact that God operates in terms of a covenant? What 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 implications does that have now for how I understand the church and how I understand myself and how sure. I understand my family. Yeah. And speaking of our uh, our Reformed Baptist brothers, I will throw a nod uh, to our friends, especially James Dolzell, a mutual friend. I've spent many, many late nights with James because he was a security guard and we were both security guards and he would relieve me from duty at one in the morning. And often I wouldn't get to bed till three in the morning because James was talking to me for two hours while I'm trying to excuse myself. But uh, he, he had some deep, deep truths that we needed to bash out. Uh, with the best of our 1689 brothers, and I love them dearly, I mean, the reasons they would still baptize adults are for typological 
and in yes. their minds, you know, covenantal and reform yes. reasons on their own. I d- happen to disagree with those, but I I I, I, categ- I treat that as categorically different than what we find in in other cases, and that's a that's a conversation we can have for, in in friendship with a, with each other. It is, and I mean, I I, I think uh, I pro- I anyone who's listened to anything I've ever done knows my knows my deep affection for James Dolls. <laughs> oh, he is a tremendous Please, brother. Please, I, I, I you no, know, no, but but the sixteen eighty nine brothers that you're talking about, you're right. That's yeah. very different. A lot of times today, and again, I'm not the language police. I don't want to be, but a lot of times right. today, when people say Reformed Baptist, what they mean is not that not yeah. those guys and so and but those guys you're right have a deeply covenantal understanding of the sacraments mm-hmm. that i don't precisely share but it is deeply covenantal amen amen so yeah that gets down to personal comfortability with the term but when i say reformed baptist that's what i'm talking about but they've got yep. a confession largely derived from that that's mine, right but- <laughs> that's right and i think that that's why that's, that's our one next of point. the reasons mm-hmm. why i added that Onto the definition because it would, it would include them. Although I specifically tackle that question at the end, uh, what about Reformed Baptists? And yeah. you know, if you read it carefully, you realize I kind of don't exactly answer the question. Well, that's there. It's an open. We'll we'll leave it for another day. But I did want to ask you about the notion of of creeds and confessions. The idea of that. Uh, another mutual friend of ours, Carl Truman, has a really wonderful book for people who may want to dive into this. Uh, the book's titled The Creedal Imperative. We interviewed him on that many years ago when the book came out. Um, if I remember, I'll try to put a link to that in the episode description as well. Um, what are your thoughts on on creeds and confessions? I know everyone's got one. It's just whether or not they'll tell you what it is or show it to you. But uh, how does this factor into, again, the definition of, of being reformed for the use of this particular book? Creeds are such a great benefit. First of all, they're biblical. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the New Testament, the New Testament envisions us having creeds. Paul says, follow the pattern of sound words that was entrusted to you. So people who say, well, I, I'm not a creedal person, I'm a Bible person, you know, no creed but the Bible. Well, the minute you start reading your Bible carefully, you're going to realize that there are creeds in the Bible. There are creeds yeah. that are contained in the scriptures. Hear, O right. Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. But also there are creeds that are not contained in the pages of scripture, but that the apostles refer to. So, Or somebody the first... interprets the Bible differently. <laughs> Well, yeah, 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 exactly. That's right. That's right. So you're immediately up against it. So right. I think it's demanded by Scripture. But right. the second the second thing I would say is it serves such a wonderful function in terms of our public witness, because mm. what, what you can do if you have a creed as a church or as an individual is you can say, look, here's here. Here are my convictions. I'm not hiding anything. And to me, this gets at what also is a Pauline conviction, which is that we need to be men of sincerity, right. that that we are the goal of our ministry, Paul says, is to serve with a clear conscience. And we're not like so many peddlers of the word of God. So we want to be Christians of integrity and of sincerity who give public witness to the truths that we hold. And that happens by way of a confession. Mm-hmm. It also serves a function internally because what it then allows you to do is to test things and to test teachers and to make it clear that there are boundaries uh, to what we believe. And if you cross those boundaries, then by our definition, you're not you're not part of our conf- uh, confessional communion any longer. Mm-hmm. And so it does serve that kind of fencing function, which is a valuable function that every organization and certainly every church needs. Uh, but but um, but I, I I wouldn't start there because I think sometimes that 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 makes creed simply a kind of negative line that you shouldn't cross. There are these there are these just rules that we put into place for for whatever reason, and we have to be careful about them. But no, no, it does serve that function, but it also serves a wonderful public function, and then and then frankly, it's just obedience to the to the uh, commands and implications of scripture. Yeah. I always find just from a practical purpose, uh, you know, it also it helps with people and they're visiting your church or you want to know yeah. what's up. Hey, here's our standards. You know, I've I've been looking at churches that I might visit when I was traveling and you look at their confession of faith or their statement of faith and it's like it's like three things. And you're like, Well, I don't know what I'm gonna get. 
Exactly. <laughs> and you know what what ends up happening? And this is on an on the ground reality. What ends up happening if if you have a a three point statement on your website and that's it. Yeah. Then functionally you're led by an individual yeah or or maybe by a group of individuals you're, you're led by the pastor or mm-hmm. or or if there are maybe some elders around him because someone has to interpret what the boundaries are beyond right. those three things yeah and and it ends up functionally being the teaching of one man so i actually think it puts it puts christians sort of in the pew at great risk i think so if there isn't a public confession of faith yeah well, and this uh, this is a short book, a really useful book. You only got a little bit of time to cover some other items, but you do address uh, the importance of establishing the authority of Scripture. That's essential to being uh, reformed, included in the uh, the solas, so to speak. Uh, you also address concerns that people might think that reform theology uh, can become, or it, that it is fatalistic or deterministic, and uh, you assuage some fears there and correct some matters. So I'm happy to talk about those if you'd like to, but I wanted to ask you uh, and make sure I got this question in regarding the role of the Holy Spirit. Some people might look at uh, reform theology or reform churches. I've had this uh, with visitors that come to my church. I should say the church where I serve. It's not my church, but the church where I serve, and they uh, maybe they're coming from a charismatic background, maybe they're charismatic themselves, uh, and they have questions. Well, what do you think? You know, do you preach the full gospel, for example? And that's kind of code word for do you do you believe in the charismatic gifts continuing today? Do you believe in signs and wonders and visions and dreams and all sorts of things? Let me tee you up real good, real well here. So, um, does the Reformed theology diminish the ongoing ministry of the Holy Spirit? Not at all. In fact, it's one of the more peculiar questions that that is. It's it's really a question that's unique, really, to our era mm. of church history, and that's because of the rise of the Charismatic and Pentecostal movement, who have cornered the market on what it means to believe in the Holy Spirit. So, if if you don't if you don't see it expressed in the way that we do, then then right. you're denying the ministry of the Holy Spirit. From a historical perspective, if you look at Calvin, for instance, I mean, he's a theologian of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it, it, this was this was a, a, a significant emphasis of his. But but not just it's not just about history and and contextualizing the time in which we live. It's also uh, misunderstanding the Bible's teaching about the role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works with the Word of God to do the work of God. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God work together to do the work of God. And so Spirit and Word are in your in your Bibles almost inextricably linked. So if we're holding up the Scriptures and teaching the Scriptures, then that is, that is a ministry of the Holy Spirit. If we're exalting Jesus Christ, well, the Holy Spirit acts as a sort of spotlight on the Lord Jesus Christ. And and if we're emphasizing the the need for uh, men and women to be born again and to mm. grow in grace as they're confronted with God's law and transformed by the preaching of the word, well, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. So mm-hmm. at every at every stage, the things that Reformed theology emphasizes and accents, perhaps more than any other uh, tradition that we might look to, are the very things that the Bible says the Holy Spirit is active in in working out and and, and in working through. So the the reason why that charge is leveled is because again, in in it's a it's a modern issue, but uh, or a contemporary issue, I should say. It, it's that it's that in the past, however many decades, uh, people have gotten the notion that what it means to believe in the Holy Spirit is to do wild things in in the context of <laughs> right. worship service and right. and to, to ha- get all kinds of notions in your mind or, or to have some ecstatic utterances or whatever it might be, which is the furthest thing from what the Bible right. says is the work of the Holy Spirit. But if we define the ministry of the Holy Spirit and we learn from God what mm. he is at work doing by his Spirit, then then the picture becomes clear and you realize that what reformed theology is teaching is actually a re-emphasis on the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. and, and, a, and a further focus on the Holy Spirit. 
than than any of the other alternatives. I suppose we might even say it's a great, greater uh, role because God doesn't just leave us up to do whatever we do, but exactly, he's working in our lives exactly. to sanctify Exactly, yes. Us. We, we, we are saying that by nature, we cannot turn ourselves to God. Mm -hmm. That it requires that the only reason that we have open eyes to see the glory of Christ. The only reason we're drawn to the truth of Scripture is because of the work of the Holy Spirit. We're accenting yeah. that work in in our Reformed convictions. Amen. One brief uh, question to follow up on that, and uh, it's another common objection that we get to Reformed theology, and it's one regarding missions and evangelism. You touch on this in the book as well. Um, how is Reformed theology and confessional theology that we find in historic creeds and confessions how is, how is that a motivation for missions and evangelism rather than a hindrance? Well, it's a motivation in two ways, at least. One, uh, we're, we recognize that we're commanded to do this in Scripture. I mean, mm -hmm. if, you, if, you re if you're reading Scripture carefully and, and Scripture alone is, is the final rule for your faith and practice, then you're, you're forced into this uh, mindset of valuing the the proclamation of Christ. How can they hear without a preacher? How can they preach unless unless he is sent? Um, and so that mandate is is on the pages of, of your Bible, and you can't miss it. But but at, at another level, I would also say this: the fact that it's God who does the work, God who persuades people, God who opens their eyes, God who elects, and Christ who saves, is a great confidence builder when it comes to these things because mm -hmm. we can go forth preaching Christ confident in the fact that in proclaiming Christ from the word of God the spirit will do his work and he will use that to draw whomsoever he has chosen to himself and so it's not our it, it's not in an ultimate sense we we're not we can't save anyone right uh, we 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 need to be faithful to the mandate of Scripture, which is clear and which pushes us out and which pushes us toward proclamation. But we are resting in the work of a sovereign God who is able to do what none of us could do through our own cleverness, yeah. our own persuasiveness, our own uh, whatever manipulation we might come up with. We we could not do it. We're talking about bringing dead people to life, and that's a work that God by his spirit does. Amen. I like to view it sometimes, you know, I like sports and all this kind of stuff, but you're always looking at and you get apprehensive before the big game and all that sort of thing, and you're wondering, can we do it? Do we have a possibility of winning? Right. And um, it's like, think about this. In, in matters of eternal significance, the Lord has chosen a people unto himself. Uh, Christ has died and been raised for them, uh, and that has been ordained from before the foundations of the world. And then God will send his spirit to apply the life, death, and resurrection of Christ to individuals in space and time. Uh, that's enough. But then think about it, that he also gives us the great privilege to be involved in communicating that message to those people whom he's going to save. So what isn't I, I'd be hard pressed to find a better motivation than to know that you uh, have guaranteed success uh, if you're right. engaged in missions and evangelism faithfully, because God's word does not return void. It's going to return its desired result always. It comes back doing that which God had ordained it to do. And wouldn't you want to be part of that, uh, especially if you have the opportunity potentially to be be an instrument to be used uh, to to uh, convert somebody? I mean, we don't convert them, but an instrument through which God uses his word to bring someone to life. That's just, I don't get it. The the people, um, and I, I understand that there are the hyper-Calvinists out there and others uh, who would diminish the role of missions and evangelism, but, it, you know, the more historic, creedal, confessional, you know, more majority view of Reformed missions certainly uh, is all for it and, uh, and is motivated to engage in it. And, uh, gives thanks to the Lord for his working among the nations. Amen. Very well said. Mm. Jonathan, it's been a tremendous uh, to have you uh, for the time Are we being. out of time already, Camden? Well, it I just, could go. It flies by on Christ the Center. <laughs> I know you've got... Well, I can't keep I can't keep the big dog from his work, so I got... 
I kind of <laughs> I'm teasing. Um, this has been yes. I, I gave I gave you my word. I said we'd try to get you out of here, and I've already gone kept you five minutes over. But um, this has been a wonderful conversation, uh, and I'm thankful for this book for for your work, but also for the the book here, Reformed Theology. Uh, in the Blessings of the Faith, the series published by uh, PNR and the series edited by Jason Hilopoulos. Jonathan, you have to come back again. We'll have to talk about some other things sometime. You ever got any questions? Not questions, but any topics or ideas? You know, just let me know. You've got an open invitation. Camden, anytime. Mm-hmm. Anytime I can I can jump on. I'd love to. I love what you're doing. It, you know this. I've told you this yeah. privately, but I'll say it on the air. Nah. These are these are dedicated <laughs> listeners, but we uh, we love it. And so, um, uh, very very grateful for what the Lord's enabling you Thank to do. Thank you. And we 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 can have ribs next time. We'll just have to make sure we we either finish them before <laughs> or start them after uh, the episode, so as not to trigger uh, Deal. The, the people like me. So uh, let me give the perfunctory plugs here and point people to the places they need to be before we sign off. But uh, head on over to gpts.edu for all the information regarding Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. Wonderful institution there. We're thankful for them and uh, just tremendous brothers. If you haven't been down, go visit uh, and take a look at their spring conference. You will not regret it. Uh, of course, you can head on over to Theology on the Go podcast at uh, theologyonthego.podbean.com. Uh, AllianceNet.org is another place to check out regarding the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. And finally, we're online at ReformedForum.org. You may be surprised. Lots of people subscribe to the podcast or watch it on YouTube, but never go to the website. Uh, You're out there. You know who you are. But uh, visit the website. There's all sorts of wonderful resources there. Uh, More than a dozen free online video courses and uh, all sorts of other publications available and information about forthcoming events. So take a look at us online at reformedforum.org. But thanks so much for listening and watching. We hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.